<laughs> One job. Right. And that's uh, everybody signed in on the sign-in sheet. Okay, so. We're going to talk about active attack events, stress response, and lockout, get out, take out. Or it could be avoid, deny, defend. Or it could be run, hide, fight. Depends on whose little world you go to. Um, FBI is, is kind of like run, hide, fight. Lockout, get out, take out is what we teach here because we don't like the word hide. I don't like that word. And uh, so that's uh, what uh, we'll present it as as best I can. And finally, well, not quite finally, we're going to talk about how things are supposed to go here at KCC. And finally, we'll do the practical at the end. And after that, there will be a scenario. Okay. So. Our objectives, define active attack events, look at their characteristics, the risk factors, and then disaster response and human nature, and leading us to get to these three items for a decision-making module, so to speak. And then again, active response by us here at KCC. Our final goal is to be prepared. I cannot stress that enough. Ultimately, at the end of this, what we're trying to do is get it so all of you start thinking in your mind what uh, I can do in a situation where you're facing mass attack, mass casualty, you have someone trying to, to hurt you. All right? Be prepared is the goal. All right. Now, this says why we are here. This is the hyper cashy market in Paris in 2015. This is a Jewish market. This guy had pledged allegiance to ISIS and uh, he comes in and starts shooting. I forgot to mention, I have videos here that might be a little bit disturbing. There is no like gore or blood or anything like that, but um, this is about the worst that you're going to see. Um, just uh, letting you know ahead of time, I guess I should have told you that before. Anyway, uh, we'll talk more about what goes on here and what happened at this place, but to say why we are here is this. I don't like to think that. What I want to say is why we're here is the person sitting next to you, the person waiting for you at home. We're here because of the state of this, that you have to be prepared. You have to start thinking, what can I do to protect myself, protect my friends, my family, and I want to go home at night, okay? That's really why we're here. Okay, there we go. All right, we'll get right to it. Active attack events, all right? We use the term active shooter. We put out things that say active shooter, but it doesn't have to be a gun, okay? It can be knife. It can be bludgeoning. It can be a car. Multiple ways. In Japan, they had the guy with the sarin gas. Multiple things, active attack events. Right? So don't just get in the mindset that it is an active shooter. Definition. Basically, what it is is attempted mass murder. Now, there's a caveat to this. It has to be, it's not gang related. It's not part of some other uh, crime that's going on, like a bank robbery and a bunch of people get shot. Basically what we're talking about is an individual or individuals that are coming in to a specific populated area to do mass murder, okay? Obviously the state of affairs you may have heard, you hear now that there are hundreds and hundreds of mass shootings across the country now. It's true. 
they don't all meet this definition of what we're talking about today. All right. Here a few weeks ago, over here in Claude Evans Park, you had a uh, dispute going on between two individuals, people everywhere in the park, and guys start shooting. All right. Luckily, he didn't hit anybody. But it doesn't quite fit this characteristics because he was specifically trying to get a, a shoot at somebody else. Like I said, luckily he didn't hit anybody. He uh, was able to get away in Battle Creek City. Later, we got a hold of him. He's been arrested. But that is different than this. Okay. Okay. Let's talk about the attacker. This is very important. No profile exists that says. If you have this, this, and this, you're going to have a mass shooter. Okay? You just, you don't. It all depends on the individual. Now, there are some things that we can say in general. Mostly, they are male. Mostly. But there have been some females as well that have done this. Majority are male. You know, um, they have generally an Avenger mindset. They want retribution back to somebody or a group of people uh, that have done them wrong in their mind. So they're going to go out and show society something. On top of that, they may want notoriety. Okay, A lot of them broadcast. You hear about manifestos that these individuals created and had. Um, these are some of the characteristics they had as well as <clears throat> Generally, you'll see they had a history of violence, exposure to some type of violence, maybe an abusive home setting. Uh, they may be substance abuse. There may be mental illness, suicidal ideation. The guys at uh, Columbine, one of the first ones, they had major suicide ideation, how they were going to go out in a blaze of glory. So these are the type of things that, that show... Um, characteristics of who these people could be. They may have stalked, or harassed, threatened people. Negative family dynamics and support system. <clears throat> the guy that did Sandy Hook, he, it was him and his mother in the house, and he basically stayed in his room, wouldn't come out. His only communication to his mother was via email. He would email her, tell her, I want lunch, bring it to me. And she would do it. Negative family dynamics. There was a problem there. And she allowed that. All right. Isolation, instability. Guy from uh, Virginia Tech considered very much people strange, isolated to himself. And you always hear later on, somebody was concerned. I was always worried about that. You know, I, was, I wondered about that guy or that kid. So these are some of the risk factors that you may see, but none of them necessarily mean you're going to have an active shooter. But just nevertheless, you be aware of that. This is the bulk of attacks, frequency of the attacks, uh, and they consistently have gone up. Now, while it does appear they have obviously skyrocketed, it does seem like we hear about it every day. Also, society is more focused on it than it was maybe so much here. So maybe there were a few others that could have been categorized in here earlier, but for the most part, it's generally going upward. Uh, now, this is as of 20, 2022. Go ahead and play that. This is mass attacks meeting the definition across the country, and their stats go until last year. Five hundred and twenty in the last 20, 20 plus years, all right, that have uh, occurred. And obviously, Michigan has had a few. You see that? We're aware of it. So it isn't just isolated. You will also note it, for the most part, we're looking at populated areas. Rural area areas don't have much good for them. Glad to hear that. But generally, where you get a lot of people, 
we're going to get this. This also is dated. Uh, this was a few years. Uh, actually, I think it's we're really getting to the point where it's like 25 to 30 per year. Okay, I want to bypass that. Okay, this still is viable. Now, a lot of times you hear about school shootings, school shootings, school shootings, you know, here or there. But in actuality, it happens at businesses more often. Okay? I mean, they're both bad, but nevertheless, the majority of these shootings occur at some type of business. Walmart, movie theater, factories, you have something like that. So it isn't just here, like here. <clears throat> Connection, 55% of the time. There is something connecting the shooter with this site. We may not know clearly what it is, but majority of the time there is. Meaning it could be someone that um, had some grudge because of something or another that happened and they're just going to take out the whole place or cause the entity, which I will talk about one of the motives of one of the shootings here in a little bit. The attack resolution, pretty much still, most of them end before the police arrive. Attack begins, attacker stops, they either leave or they uh, commit suicide. The guy from Parkland was able to escape and left, and they found him later. He left. Attack begins. <clears throat> Victim stops them. Subdued, or on a rare occasion, an actual uh, victim is able to shoot them and stop them. Okay. 43% generally end after the police arrive. The attack stops. They commit them, they kill themselves or they surrender, or the police stop them, they subdue them, or they shoot them, okay? Now, does the attacker kill themselves? Now here, this is again, these statistics are viewed from te Texas A&M. There are a lot of experts out there that are saying that the majority of the time, the shooter does kill themselves, and it does seem that way. But they're saying it's about a quarter of the time that they kill themselves. There are plenty, I've heard plenty of experts listen to them talk, and they say this number is actually uh, more like 60 or 70 percent of the time. I don't know where they're drawing their numbers, but clearly they do. We know that a lot of times attackers do kill themselves. And uh, there are plenty of examples that I can, uh, I will be able to show you that they do. But it does happen. Now we're going to talk about active events in recent years. Here we go. University of California, Santa Barbara, 2014. This guy, here's a case. Uh, he actually killed six people. He shot three and he stabbed three. But then he went on a spree with a vehicle and he's running people over. What is his motive? He wanted revenge at women. He wanted to get women because he couldn't get a date. He was angry and his little manifesto or his recording at the end was how upset he was with women because he couldn't get a date. <clears throat> Orlando Poltz here. A lot of you probably have heard of these. Uh, this guy pledged himself to ISIS and decided he was going to attack this bar, which, by the way, he frequented. He killed 49 people, wounded another 53. This is with a, a firearm, an assault rifle. He ended up being held up in the bathroom for three hours before police could get to a point where they could get to him, and the police killed him. Oh, by the way, the first guy and the other one, he did kill himself. Now... This is an example of an open-air killing. 
I remember what I said, active attackers are in a populated area where they're trying to do mass murder. This meets the definition, obviously, even though the area was outside. He had uh, you know, rented a uh, motel or hotel room way up high, and uh, basically he got a vantage point of the concert that was going on down below, and he began firing. Now, <clears throat> police try to get to him. Ultimately, he kills himself. He does kill himself. So that leaves the, the police were left wondering what his motive is. Now, a few months ago, it was came out very quietly that the FBI had uh, finished their investigation, and they think they have an idea of what his motive was. This guy was a very, one of these high roller poker players, go to these poker tournaments, and especially he would frequent the Mandalay Bay Hotel. And when he started, he was kind of wealthy, and uh, slowly he began losing money at the Mandalay Bay, and uh, he and uh, when he finally died, or they looked, he only had like $250,000 left in his account. But anyway, uh, they surmised that he wanted to make Mandalay pay. And that indeed they did, because they ended up having to pay out millions of lawsuits. But that is what they surmised is his motive. He was mad at the hotel. Here we got another guy in New York that was using a vehicle to run people over, okay? He killed eight people on bikes, much like the guy over in Kalamazoo. He had pledged himself to uh, ISIS. He injured another 11. He came out, he didn't have a gun, but he came out with a paintball gun and threatened people with it and the police shot him. He was taken into custody. This one, Sutherland Springs, Texas, the church, 2017. The guy goes into this church. He kills 26 people with an assault rifle. He wounds another 22 others. An armed citizen sees what he's doing and confronts him. And that citizen shoots him, but he's able to get in his car and take off. Um... The citizen flags down another person. They proceed to chase him. He crashes the car, and uh, he ends up, uh, he's shot in the stomach, but he ends up killing himself. This also was recently in the news. This is the guy that had been dishonorably charged, uh, discharged from the Air Force, and it was for domestic abuse, all right? The Air Force did not put that into the, his criminal history into the law enforcement computer, so he was able to purchase the firearms because that conviction was not there. The Air Force paid out $144 million to all of the uh, families that were involved in that. So, Okay, and those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. We see this is happening all the time, and yet it does seem to be a sad state of affairs that it continues, that we're not learning. All right. The number of deaths. Now, as much as I told you, more often than not, these end before the police arrive, but yet at the same time, um, the killer generally knows the police are, in fact, coming. So, the number of deaths determine on how quickly the police arrive. Generally, especially those who have fixated on mass killing, they know what is happening. The guy from Virginia Tech, he knew police are coming, and he did some efforts to try to stop the police from getting to him, because he knows. So, the number of deaths and how police, quickly police arrive and target availability. What does that mean? That means three minutes. General. In general, three minutes from the call 
comes to them till they arrive. Three minutes is, I'd say that's pretty good here, actually. We are on KCC main campus. We are surrounded by Battle Creek City Police and Calhoun County Police. RMTC, a little bit further out. There might be a little more of a delay, but nevertheless, they are in the city limits of, of uh, Battle Creek. You get further out in a rural area, area, this may be longer. It's just a matter of, of fact. Just so you're aware. But in the end, we have this period of time that we need to reduce target availability. Hence, lock out, get out, take out. Those three minutes, I'm trying to get you to be prepared, start thinking what you can do to basically save yourself or save your friends or somebody dear to you from being attacked until the police come and deal with that situation. Okay, now we're gonna talk about disaster response. What does disaster response have to do with active shooter? Well, they use the word disaster, and there are two, two common things here, disaster and human nature. Whether it's a tornado comes through here and terrorizes the campus, earthquake, which is very unlikely, or maybe, you know, we have a, a plane crash into the college, or you have someone walking around with an assault rifle shooting people, all of them meet kind of a definition of disaster, and human response is the same for each. So that's why we're going to talk about uh, high stress situations. Okay, there are three stages. Denial, deliberation, and decisive moment. As you see, these two are having a little squabble over it. <laughs> he doesn't think denial is. Denial is basically you have a situation going on you've never experienced before, and you're saying this can't be happening. All right, it has another name, normalcy bias. All right, it is a mental state. I'm facing a crisis that can cause people to either deny or underestimate the crisis, uh, and even rationalize the crisis away. The assumption is made that since this crisis has never happened before. It will not occur now, which can result in the inability of people to cope with the disaster once it occurs. People with normalcy bias have difficulties reacting to something they have not experienced before, and they also tend to interpret warnings in the most optimistic way possible, seizing on any ambiguities to infer a less serious situation. Everybody goes through normalcy bias. Everybody does. Police officers go through this. Police officers have gone to uh, calls or situations and they are encountering a person that is trying to hurt them or kill them and they've never encountered this before. They've always been able to get cooperation here and there, maybe minimal fights, and now you have somebody who's trying to kill them and they do not react quickly enough and appropriately enough. It happens to us all. Here is an example of one in 1999. We have an active uh, attacker. He shoots two in the foyer area, then advised two females in the hallway that it was a drama taking place. He remembered that uh, an attack or a, a drama had been done before, and so they believe he's an actor. And as you see, that. They said, oh, shoot me. They, they looked at it in an optimistic way and not realizing this was really happening. All right, I want to go to this uh, YouTube video. Um, this gentleman, his name is Eric Stewart. You're going to see a video, and he will explain. He explains the normalcy bias better than I can. He is an... The so normalcy bias being out cut. Go ahead and pause that for a second. He is an expert at putting on mass events, like concerts or sporting events. He's done those at uh, 
the United States, Canada, and the UK. And he ex does a good job of explaining the normalcy bias. Go ahead. What's going on there with both of you and others is a delay in your normalcy bias being overcome. What you expected today was to get up at the hotel. I know from seeing a few of you last night that you were going to wake up in the hotel this morning and when you went to bed last night, you were pretty convinced you were going to wake up with a bit of a headache. Because I saw you. I heard you. You woke up, you got up, and within the first five or six seconds of waking up this morning, your brain said, this is what today looks like. We're going to go across the road into a big black box where there's going to be a video screen and a whole lot of people speaking to us. We're going to have a cracking lunch and feel a little bit dozy in the afternoon. Then some more lectures. Then we're going to finish. Then we're going to go back to the hotel or we're going to go to Lancaster. We're going to have a drink. And that's what today looks like. And then suddenly something changes that. And your brain, having drawn the path of what today looks like, struggles to break out of normality. And we've got a number of incidents of this, a number of examples of where normalcy bias takes a long time to overcome. If any of you have read the 9-11 reports, you will probably, like me, have said, what on earth was going on when the aeroplane crashed into the first building and everybody felt the explosion, some of them saw the aircraft, then they smelt fuel, they saw bits of metal falling past their windows, and their reaction to that was, well, I'll just finish this email. What? A thousand people in that building continued sending emails for up to 25 minutes after the first aircraft went in. That's hardly normal behavior. It's certainly not a panic reaction to being in a position of extreme danger. Maybe if some people had reacted quicker and had a little bit of panic and a little bit of urgency, there might have been better outcomes for a lot of people. This normalcy bias is one of our greatest dangers. It's there for a reason, it's there to protect us. If every time we heard a bang or saw an unusual light or heard an unusual noise or something different out of the ordinary happened, our reptile kicked in the adrenaline and all the other drugs that go around our body, squirt everything up there that says, take all the blood from my hands, all the blood from my toes and put all that food and that oxygen into my thighs and my arms because I'm either going to fight my way out of this or I'm going to run. If that happened every time, our lives would be much, much shorter because we'd be burning parts of our body dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of times a day. And so normalcy bias is there to protect us. That's its job. It's the, hang on a minute, let me just check because this can't really be happening. Because, hey, people like me don't die in terrorist attacks, do they? People like me don't lie on a beach in Tunisia, sunning ourselves, having a wonderful time laid back and reading a book, and then look across and see a man walking up a beach shooting people dead. We know from the research into that and from the evidence at the inquest that two ladies were laying at the end of the beach. They sat up from their novels, they looked down the beach, they saw the man coming towards them, and then they laid back down and carried on reading. Can't ask you what went through their brains, because both of them were dead. Both of them died as a result, primarily, I think, of normalcy bias, because they failed to react to a situation of great danger. They were ultra relaxed. They were in the worst possible condition they could have been for that emergency that day, because people like them don't lay on beaches and get shot by terrorists. It just doesn't happen to people like us, right up to the point when it happens to people like us. If we know that normalcy bias exists and we hear our brain saying, this must be a film set, this can't be real, this must be, must be happening to something, somebody else. If you know it exists, you can overcome it much quicker. On average, the figure that's quoted is about seven or eight seconds for normalcy bias to be overcome. If you know it exists, two, three, four seconds, giving you a four or five second advance, advantage potentially to react quicker than anybody else. And bear in mind, you are the people that will be there. You saw the video this morning, staff that were at the multiple shootings saying, hey, have we got fireworks scheduled for tonight? To which they all knew the answer. There was no fireworks scheduled that night. We should know if there's fireworks in our show. And if we hear something, hear something that sounds like fireworks and we know there's no fireworks, we shouldn't be even needing to ask that question. We should know and we should be reacting to that. We should know what to do. nature, which they call social proof. We also all use social proofs. We look to others to guide us. All right. Now, this is a video that they put in here. 
I don't think this video does justice to what they're trying to say, but nevertheless, we will go ahead and, and uh, play it. Go ahead and play it. Plays like this street in New York City. If you were unfortunate enough to be the victim of a crime or taken ill unexpectedly, you might think that surrounded by all these people, someone would intervene. After all, isn't there safety in numbers? Psychologists say no. Research suggests that often a victim is less likely to receive assistance when surrounded by a group rather than a single bystander. When people are in a crowd, it's easier to pass the buck. It's what psychologists call the diffusion of responsibility. Liverpool Street Station in London, a busy thoroughfare for commuters. Unknown to these passers-by, Peter is an actor. As part of an experiment on bystander apathy, he's pretending to be ill. How long before he gets help? Helping would be inconvenient or even risky. He lies there for more than 20 minutes and no one raises an eyebrow. It's always very distressing to watch situations like this where people are obviously suffering and no one's actually helping them. But what we have here is two conflicting rules. One is the rule we ought to help and the other is the rule that we ought to do what everybody else is doing. And here you have a, a group of, effectively a group of strangers who are exerting the pressure not to intervene, not to help, and it's very difficult to rebel. Ruth, another actor, takes Peter's place. How long before she receives help? Four minutes later, and 34 people have passed without stopping. Well, people don't really want to know. They just haven't got the time. Well, they have got the time. They just don't want to get involved. Unwittingly, these strangers have silently formed a temporary group with a rule. Don't get involved. They're afraid to stand out for the crowd and won't take action if no one else does. This woman has clearly spotted Ruth, but she conforms to the rule and does nothing. Watch what happens, though, when someone else helps. She suddenly oh, finds you. herself in a different group with a new group to help. That's what she was saying. Then I saw the check to see if she was breathing or not. And I looked around and I couldn't believe that no one had noticed it because there was a bloke that sat there just absorbed in reading the newspaper. This time, Peter's dressed as a respectable gentleman. Now that his dress is in keeping with those around him, how long before he's rescued? Six seconds. She even calls him sir, and suddenly everyone's a good Samaritan. Do you suffer from a pity? No. Why you lying on the floor Because he's part of the right group. Everyone wants to help. I would just hate to be in his position of feeling ill, um, and nobody helped him walking past, so I just like to check that he was okay. And I thought, well, it's wet, so he must really be up. He's going to ruin the suit anyway. <laughs> I don't like this video because I, they're trying to show that people uh, can form groups in, uh, in dealing with situations, but that is more deal with social situations. But nevertheless, social proof is real. We all use social proof. Okay, deliberation. So finally, if you've gotten through your <clears throat> normalcy bias, and you've gotten through maybe looking at others and maybe saying, yeah, these guys are wrong, you're going to make a decision. Deliberation. Now you have to make a decision, and we have the human brain, and we have lizard brain. <laughs> right now, we're all sitting here, we're all having a nice little conversation, and watching this we're all in our human brain we're rational we're understanding we're comprehending but in deep down inside 
even Eric said, the lizard brain comes out, and it's going to take over. And it will, let's see, fight, flight, freeze. This happens when you put enough stress on somebody. Like I said, you, all of a sudden, when you finally realize you are facing something really bad, the lizard brain may take over, and these are the things that you got to start worrying about. Fight, flight, or freeze. All right. Again, we're all sitting here. Hopefully most of you are right around here. Your uh, blood pressure is low, you're just relaxing. Me, I'm up a little bit higher. I'm moving around and talking a little stress here. But as you put stress on somebody, this goes up. The more stress you apply, the further goes up. And as you keep going up this curve, things happen to your body. You heard Eric, he said the body is automatically going to start taking the blood and uh, it's going to try to protect itself into the major or organs and then it's going to release certain hormones into your body. All of this will occur as you go up. What happens to motor control as you go up? You got enough stress on you, are you able to do it? You know, we all see the horror movie where the person is trying to dial 911 or trying to get the key in the door because this threat is coming up against them. It's the same type of thing. Their body is going up. And as you keep going up, other things happen to you. Auditory exclusion. You no longer hear stuff. You have tunnel vision focused solely on um, what you're, you're seeing. And if you put enough pressure on somebody, they will lose their bowels, they will lose uh, their bladder. Uh, it's just, you put enough stress on somebody, that will happen. Now we're going to go back to, the, we're going to go back to Paris, because we'll always have Paris here. And this is the Hypercashy uh, market where that guy came in and started shooting. And I want you to notice the lady. Now, she's probably taken her kid out of that thing hundreds of times, maybe. She is stressed. Her motor functions are all just, so she even just manhandles the kid out at the end to get the kid out. All that is, is uh, out the door because enough stress has been put on her. All right. Now, this is the Station Nightclub, 2003. This is a better example of where social proof can be wrong. What happened here is Great White is doing a concert. And uh, you're going to see here in a second what happened there. But essentially a huge fire started whose fault it is. The owner of the bar blames Great White. Great White blames the owner of the bar. It, it was it was a mess. I think they did a I saw a show on this not too long ago. But anyway, notice where the exits are. I think the guy who's taking this video is actually pretty smart.
Once that um, flame started to uh, come up over here, the whole, caught the whole ceiling on fire, this exit that was there is basically done. So what was left is the main entrance and the two over there. And hardly anybody used these. These are where all the bodies were found. Most of them died from smoke inhalation. It was 100 dead, 230 were injured, 132 were able to escape. A lot of people, again, they go and they don't know about these other exits because they don't think about that. And here you had social proof again. Well, first you have normal class. Well, this can't be happening. I'm sure it, yeah, it'll be all right. No. You have other people standing around thinking, no, oh, it'll be okay. Same thing. Then when they finally do try to get out, that's a problem. And in the end, we have this. Still, of people climbing, trying to climb over others to try to get out. Put enough stress on them. Lizard brain was in effect here. Got to get out of here. Got to get out of here. Screw everybody else. I got to get out of here. So... What I'm trying to tell you is you got to try to keep in your human brain as long as possible. Please, <clears throat> calm yourself. Obviously, maybe we're not at a bar that's gone on fire, but maybe it is an active shooter in this building somewhere trying to hurt a bunch of people. You've got to try to keep calm. Breathe. These, a lot of these smartphones, they have these breathing exercise apps on them. You can get them and help you. I'm not suggesting that maybe you do that right in the middle of a, an active shooter, but if you practice it enough, like anything else, it would be good. Shift your emotion, okay? If you are deathly afraid of something, something is going on with you, whether it's a phobia or an active shooter, I'm telling you, shift your emotion out of that fear. Now, tell me an emotion that you could go to, not fear. Any ideas? Anger. There you go. Get mad. You want to change your mental thinking real quick? You know, I'm so afraid, I'm so afraid. You know what? This person is doing something to me. The heck with that. Screw that. That ain't right. It ain't right, and I'm going to get mad. That will affect your body. That will affect your mind. So you start, I'm going to do this. Or, you know, whether it's attacking that person or, hey, I'll show you, I'm going to get away and I'm not going to give you that satisfaction. Shift the emotion. And I put in here, obviously, stay fit because the more healthy you are, the better you're able to deal with stress. It's just the fact. We all know that, you know. Um, it's like, you all know you shouldn't smoke because uh, if you smoke, it's bad for your health. It's the same type of thing. You know, you try to do things to keep yourself healthy. You can deal with stress later or better. All right. But, I have to say but, no matter what, you put enough stress on the human brain, you're going to go into lizard. All right? You're going to go into where the lizard at least is trying to take over. So what can you do about that? Script and practice. All right? So <clears throat> when I first started police work, man, many years ago, many years ago, they sent me out and said, here is your revolver. We didn't have automatic weapons. The standard across the country was a revolver, not an automatic. All right, And then you go to the range, and you have six shots. And um, generally, in general, um, you'd qualify there. And they would teach you how to qualify. And this happened uh, across the country a lot. Is uh, They would have the officer shoot, open the cylinder, and dump the brass into his hand. And the reason they did that is because they want to try to save money. We need to save money. We're going to take that brass and we're going to clean it. And we're going to uh, have it reloaded for reloads for qualification. So don't throw it on the ground. 
because you throw it on the ground and it's really hard to clean. You got to pay more, and then you can't use it if you can't clean it because you can't have the uh, bullets explode in the gun. So keep the bullet uh, shell cases, put them in your pocket, and at the end we'll all collect them. Well, what happens? Eventually, some officers have to get into a shooting with somebody, and they run out of bullets, and they're under stress, and unfortunately, some of these officers die. And when they come across them, they check them. They have bullet shell casings in their pocket. Why? Why? Because that's how they were trained, scripted. They script it over and over. This is how you do it. I shoot, I empty my hand, put it in my pocket. All right? Even now, even with an automatic, the same type of thing. If I, yeah, I've got a lot more bullets, but if I keep shooting enough, it will go empty. Which case, same thing. I got to empty that magazine, put another one in. Now, like, I don't know, I'm a little anal. Uh, I don't like my stuff being dirty. I don't like my magazine on the floor because, you know, someone will step on it and crush it and cause, cause problems. But i got to overcome that, and you train, you dump the magazine at the same time you put the new one in. So, you do something enough, you script it, your body will go back to how you trained it, right? It's kind of a little bit like, you ever been driving down the road and... Uh, you're thinking about something or another, and then you realize, you know, there is a light back there. Did I stop for that light? Well, you probably did, because your mind has already been trained that that is green, or that was red, and I had to go. But you don't really think about it. That's the type of thing. You're scripting yourself so you will do something in a certain way. It helps to practice. Practice it. And so when I'm talking about being prepared, I want you to be prepared if something bad happens, I want you to start scripting. You're going to know. If I hear this, if this is going on, this is where I'm going to go. This is what I'm going to do. You can't, you know, plan for every situation, but in general, especially where you're sitting in your offices or you're sitting in your cubicles, wherever you're sitting, start thinking in my mind, I'm going to do this. And actually, I want you to get up and do it. Go into the next room and shut the door. Get up and do it. Practice it. Rick Criscola. This guy, he was the security officer for uh, uh, Dean Winter, Morgan Stanley, at the World Trade. He was at the first bombing of the World Trade Center back in 1993, and he knew. He said to himself, they're going to attack, somebody's going to attack this building. He knew ahead of time then. So, he was the chief security person. He became a thorn in the side, so to speak, to the executives, because he would call for drills for his people in the office at just the most inconvenient times. You know, they're making big deals. And here this guy comes in and said, nope, this is a drill. Everybody got to get up and let's go. And when 9-11 happens, they, uh, he was in tower, they were in tower two. He sees tower one has been hit. And the Port Authority, authority told them, everybody stay in place, shelter in place. I said, no, no, we trained for this. Everybody up and out. And he is credited for getting 2,700 people out of that building and saving their lives. He then went back in to see if he could find somebody else or find more people. And that's when uh, the uh, towers came down. Same type of thing. You train enough. You train enough over and over. You practice enough. Then it becomes second nature. Everybody knows what we got to do. Let's do it. Decisive moment. Okay. So, the quicker you get through denial and through deliberation, you will finally get to your decisive moment. Once you've made that decision, act quickly, decisively, 
that may save your life or the lives of others. All right, we'll watch, listen to these guys here. A little less than a month ago, three childhood friends were on a train bound for Paris and they heard a gunshot. Amid screams and commotion of the passengers, they quickly focused on a man wielding an AK-47. Almost instantly, one of them said, let's go, and the three ran toward the shooter. Those three friends are with us here today. Thank you, Alec, Spencer, and Anthony, for what you did on that train and for joining us here. And that's because after Alex said, let's go, he and Spencer and Anthony sprinted toward the gunman while he trained his rifle on them. Spencer tackled the assailant and the three worked to disarm him. As we know, Spencer was stabbed in that effort. After they knocked out the gunman, they tended to other injured on board before paramedics and police arrived. They are in the military, obviously. They've had training, but they knew they went through it all very quickly and made a decision to attack. All right, civilian response. Okay, I'm supposed to play this, which I think is ridiculous. Those are supposed to be gunshots, All right? You're not supposed to think, oh, that's just coming out of the speaker. No, those are real gunshots. Get out of denial. <laughs> Go right to deliberation. Well, to me, those don't sound like gunshots. Obviously, something along those lines, I want you to get out of denial quickly. All right. All right. Here is a video about playing dead. We heard the first shots at around 9.40 a.m. Uh, I was sitting on the wall of the classroom, Virginia so in the hallway, and I could hear the shots get closer and closer very quickly. I mean, there was only a few seconds between the first time we heard them and when he actually walked in. To me, it sounded like um, an axe being taken to a piece of wood. And our teacher, she opened the door, and she peered outside, and she immediately shut the door, and she said, call 911. And right then, he walked in just seconds after. Um, there's absolutely no time to to think or to duck or to take cover. And people just kind of fell to the floor. And he immediately walked in shooting and he went to the other side of the classroom and he started going down the rows. He went down each row very quickly, very purposefully. And I remember thinking, your, your turn is coming. You're going to get shot. I mean, I didn't realize there was an active shooter, but I knew something bad was happening. He came back to our classroom three times, and on the third time, he killed himself in the front of the class. In between each time he was there, you could just hear people crying and coughing, and the cell phone started ringing. Um, when he was in our class, I remember trying not to breathe very much, so he couldn't tell I was alive. Because as my son was hitting the, the chair, I was thinking, you know, he could see me breathing, he could see me alive, and, and that was very scary. I'll never forget when the SWAT team first broke in um, at around 951. The officer in the front of the classroom said, we have a lot of blacks in here. And at the time, I couldn't comprehend what he was talking about, but he met triage codes. And I remember looking into the girl to my right and realizing, what black meant. He looked over me and he said, first he said yellow, and then he changed it and he said red, and that's when I first started panicking. I still couldn't speak. I was shot three times, lying on my back, and I remember thinking, what do you see? Like, what can you see on me that I can't, that you would change me from yellow to red? He killed 12 people in my classroom, including our teacher. So, initially she didn't play dead. Uh, but when he came back, because he came back multiple times, and she did. I can't fault her from doing what she did. But in general, playing dead does not help you. Yes. 
So, uh, yeah, but playing dead doesn't always work out the way you think it should, all right? You can obviously crawl under the desk and hide and hope, but uh, I would hope that you have now started preparing to think in your head, what am I going to do and have a better plan than this? Are you going to fault the person for crawling under the desk? I guess you can't really do that, but nonetheless, you're now, whether you survive is at the whim of this person or some type of, of luck, all right? It is not the best option for you. All right, we're telling you once you get out of denial and you're looking at deliberation, these are the three things I want you to focus on as your decision-making model. Get out, lock out, take out. Those are the three things, whatever it is, that's what I want you to focus on. Whether you're here at the college or you're at Walmart and something like this might happen, I want you to start thinking, where can I go using these three type of options? That's what I want you to start thinking about. And then act on them accordingly. All right. Situational awareness. This is the Panama, um, Panama City Council uh, meeting. I believe it was in 2010. Um, you will uh, watch how people react as they see what is happening. This will be the first step in that whole process. Oh. I told you, everybody in this room. I've got a While admirable, I don't think she fully uh, thought through her plan uh, and given her size, and I have no idea what she is. But, I mean, he, had a, he has a grudge against the council. Uh, this is actually school board, not city council. It's a school board meeting. Uh, his wife was a teacher, and uh, she got fired. And he was there to uh, try to set it right. Um, ultimately, he does end up shooting at the uh, board, but he misses. He doesn't hit any of them. Security guard comes back in, engages him, shoots him, and uh, he ultimately kills himself. The whole point of video was kind of to watch what human behavior was going on here, what people did. He basically, he told uh, the women that they could go, but he wanted the guys. And you notice the people, oh, I'm just gonna take all my stuff. But he could have easily just started shooting everybody, in which case, you notice the one lady did get down quick. I don't wanna, I don't want to demonize and say that she did the wrong thing, but I want you to start thinking about your situation and what you can do. You have a contrast here. You have some people that are just taking their time. You have another person that's hiding, and then you have another person that's attacking. Maybe the other should have fought, but she obviously didn't convey that enough to them where they thought this is a good idea, especially given her size and him. Okay. Get out. Basically, leave as soon as possible. Know your exit. Call 911. Okay? 
I want you to start thinking about, again, we're talking about situational awareness, not just here, anywhere. Get out, get out, go, leave. You're in the hallway and you hear something going on, leave. You know, uh, call 911, let people know, or call Central Dispatch, advise them what you, what you hear, what you've seen, what you know, all right? What are these people doing? They're getting out. People that were sitting in the car back there, they all got out. If you have that ability, do so. All right. Is there a way, other way you can get out? Secondary exits. My understanding is uh, they, these two could have gone out that exit. They didn't. I don't know why. They could have gone up. I assume that's an access to the roof. This is all part of that uh, uh, Paris uh, um, grocery, store. grocery store. He, uh, that guy, um, he killed four people in there. He was holding 15 hostage. Uh, another worker was able to take a group of individuals and take them and hide them in a cooler. He escapes. When he comes out, though, the French police grab him and think maybe he's the suspect, and he has to finally convince them that no, 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 uh, what he's done. But uh, ultimately, uh, the police engage him, and I believe they kill him. Um, deny it. Lock out. Just talked about it. Lock the door. You know, make it so the place looks abandoned, like no one's here. Keep out of sight. Now, again, our doors are already set to lock, which we're at an advantage there. But if you have to lock the door, lock it. Barricade. Well, I'm going to talk about barricading doors here when we do the practical. But more stuff you put over the door, the better. And why are we doing this? Three minutes. Reduced target availability. That person is going to have to look for easier game. And you want to make it so you're not that. All right. Back to there. Could they have taken this and move it over here? Uh, yeah. All this stuff. Move it over there. Look around you. See what's there. Door stops. We'll talk about door stops here in a little bit. Okay. We'll also talk about using ropes. I have ropes. I will, uh, we'll talk about using them to, to help uh, secure the door. Looking at all sorts of things that you can use to help. All right. Here's a video on uh, a teacher that did lock out uh, from a shooter. Teachers do how much they care even in the face of terror and I sat down with the first grade teacher at that school Caitlin Roick she heard gunfire large windows exposed her classroom so she managed to rush 15 small children into a tiny bathroom to try to save their lives I just knew we had to get in there and I was just telling them it's going to be okay you're going to be all right. I, I had pulled a bookshelf before I closed the door in front of it. So it was completely, we were completely barricaded in. I turned the lights off. Did you tell them to be quiet? Did you oh, yes. worry about one of them? No, I told them. I told them to be quiet. I told them we had to be absolutely quiet. Uh, because I was just so afraid that if he did come in and then he would hear us and then he would maybe just start shooting the door. So I said, no, we just have to be absolutely quiet. Um, and we have, I said, there are bad guys out there now. We need to wait for the good guys. And I said, yeah. I, I, I just... I wanted us to be okay, and I'm so so saddened that there are people who, who in this situation are not okay. Um, and my heart my heart goes out to anyone who knew them and was part of their lives that I just can't imagine. Did they cry? 
no, if they started crying, I would like take their face and say, it's gonna be okay, show me your smile. Like I really tried to like, you know, and one of my students was, you know, would say like things like, I know karate, so it's okay, I'll lead the way out. Like, they really said to you, we wanna go home for Christmas. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know, I just want to hug my mom, or just, you know, things like that that were just, just heartbreaking, you know? And like, in my mind, I mean, because you're hearing, I've never been a part of something, obviously, anywhere near this traumatic. Um, and so I'm hearing the gunfire in the hallway, and I'm thinking in my mind, I, I'm the first classroom, why isn't he coming? You know, I'm thinking, we're next, and, you know, and in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, as, as a six-year-old, seven-year-old, what are you? What are your thoughts? What are your, you know? And I'm, I'm thinking that I have to, to almost be their parent. Like I have to tell them, you know. So I said to them, I said, I need you to know that I love you all very much, and that it's going to be okay. Because I thought that was the last thing they were ever going to hear. I thought we were all going to die. Um, you know, and I don't know if that's okay. You know, teachers and you know, but I wanted them to know someone loved them, and I wanted them that to be one of the last things they heard. Uh, not not the gun to fire. No, 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 no. It's just so horrible. So horrible. Horrible, horrible. Um, How did you know you were going to be okay? What I didn't. Um, what finally happened was the gunfire stopped. The gunfire wasn't um, that long, um, so that stopped. But I, st I said, "No, we're not going anywhere. We're standing here um, until someone good comes and um, sorry gets us out." So eventually, what happened was the police came and started knocking. Um, and obviously, I mean, I was completely beside myself. And I said, "I don't, I don't believe you. Um, you need to put your badges under the door." Um, so they put their badges under the door. I said, if you're really a police officer, then you would have a way to get in here. You would have a key, or you would have gotten it from the janitor. If everything's okay now, you would have found the keys. So he had the keys, and he found the right one, and he unlocked the door, and then they brought us out to the um, firehouse to meet up with the rest of um, the teachers and students, waiting for parents to come and pick them up. <sighs> I think there are a lot of people who wish... So, <clears throat> she was the first classroom. Uh, you'd think he would have gone in there. They had done an active shooter drill like a week before, and they surmised that there was a card or something in the window of the door it said something like, um, all clear or room cleared. So he moved back beyond that and uh, started shooting in uh, the next classroom. But she did the right thing in that she got all those kids into an area that she could lock and keep that guy out as best she can, <clears throat> and he had he found other targets to go after. Of course, he didn't know she was in there, but that's beside the point. That's what she did, and that was the thing to do. Deny him access. Okay, let's talk about takeout. All right, you're in your defense, your area that you have locked them out, and for whatever reason person has decided they fixated on your room and they're going to come in and whatever reason you have no choice you have to uh, you're either going to hide or you're going to put up a fight and I recommend you put up a fight okay now we have a door over here we shut the door and uh, the person is coming in the door where do we want to be positioning where is it important to be is it a good idea to be way over there on the other side of the room or up near the door? Obviously, it's closer to the door where you want to be because especially if you don't know how much they've got to do to get in the door, you want to try to be able to deal with that individually quickly. You can't do it when you're across the room or you're away from the door. You want to be near it. Grab the weapon to the best of your ability. and We'll go over this more in the, in the practical. And then... Fight, play dirty. This person's trying to hurt you. Do whatever you got to do. Hurt them back. Um, yeah, do what you got to do. And as I said before, shift your emotions. Get angry. Because if you're in a state of fear and you're trying to do something, it isn't as well as if you're angry. You build up more muscle to, uh, strength to, to attack. I'm mad. Okay, back to Paris, and I want you to notice 
this gentleman, and then I want you to notice the lady. So the gentleman that grabbed the bottle, is my understanding, he does survive. He does not attack the guy. He's able to escape. Her, uh, I don't know what her fate is, but who do you think had the better fate? Would, would be better off? Now, I will tell you that also in this, um, I don't know, in the first video if you noticed, the gunman was having trouble with his, uh, with his weapon. It was jamming. He ends up putting that weapon down and transitioning to uh, another gun. Two employees decided they were going to attack, and they picked up that weapon, and the gun was jammed. It had already jammed. It wasn't any good. So unfortunately, those two individuals did die. But um, in theory, it was a good plan, except clearly he was having problems with the weapon, when they try to get it, it didn't work out for them. But this person at least has a plan. I'm going to do something. And this is what I want you to start thinking about. I'm going to do something here. She's at the whim of whatever. And I don't want you to be like that. Well, yeah, because she got to think. He has no need to walk down that aisle. All right. So you lay there and you're a target. Well, and he did hold... Uh, and I don't know if she was one of the hostages that he held. He did hold, get a group together, and he held them. It could very well be. All right. Now I want to talk about Lieutenant Murphy. Brian Murphy. This guy is some. Notice the scar he has here. So he responded to a shooting, mass shooting at uh, a Sikh temple. And... The guy goes in and he shoots, I believe he shoots six people, I think is what he said. He is the first officer on scene. He pulls up. The guy now has to disengage what he's doing in the church and comes out and engages him. This man was shot 15 times and is still alive and he goes around and he does talk uh, about what happened. And he decided, I'm not going to die this way. And he fought. Um, he was taking the brunt of the attack. He did return fire, but ultimately it was another officer that came around from a different angle and was able to shoot the suspect. But the suspect, um, I believe he ultimately killed himself. But this is the mindset that you want to think about. Now, my brother heard him talk, and uh, he said that they, him and his wife were scheduled to go on vacation in the Bahamas, I think, or in the Caribbean the following week. And he was thinking, gosh, she's going to be mad. Oh, she's going to be mad. <laughs> so, but he survived after being shot 15 times. All right. Situational awareness. Avoid, deny, defend. Get out, lock out, take out. This determines that decision making that I want you to think about. If you're out in the hall and you see Jasmine is right next to a bad guy that's trying to hurt her, and you're way down the hall, your options are, oh, I can get out. I can go over here and lock myself in. You could theoretically go help Jasmine if you wanted to. Or you could say, I'm sorry. Now, Jasmine's options are a little different here, isn't it? Her situation is, I guess I got to fight. I got to fight, or that's it. And I'm going to give up the ghost. But you see, the situational awareness depends basically on what, you're, what you have. If you've got more time, you've got more decisions. Just be aware. But these are the three that I want you to focus on. Okay, and what you do matters.
Remember those three minutes. Okay? The attack starts. You have a primary exit? Yes. Get out. No. Lock out. Are there other exits? Windows. Yes. Get out. No. You have no other choice. Fight. Virginia Tech. We just saw the lady talking about playing dead in there. Uh, this is down in Virginia. It's Blackburg or something like that, Virginia, I believe. Norris Hall. <clears throat> they show Norris Hall as where the shooting happened. But actually, the initial event happened, I believe it's Johnston Hall, two hours before. Police get called, and that's a residence hall. Please get called there, and there are a male and a female found dead in a room, one of the uh, rooms, and the police get called, they go in, they say, oh, we got two dead people here, and dead from gunshots. Well, they're thinking, well, it must be murder-suicide, but because of uh, lab stuff, we don't want to touch the scene. We don't want to mess with the bodies that call CSI type thing to come in. Eventually, close to two hours later, they finally move the bodies and see what do they see? They don't see is a gun. They then realize, oh, this isn't murder suicide. Somebody killed these two people. So that takes us to about 9 30. And um, at that point, they put out a lockdown to, to the college. Now, for whatever reason, I have no idea, I can't explain it, uh, um, Norris Hall does not get locked down. <clears throat> I don't know what happened there or what their procedures are. At 9.45, he's in there and he is attacking. This is the hallway on the second floor, and then this breaks down the different rooms that they were in. Obviously, the Reds are all people that were killed, and uh, Greens for the survival. And then here. Now, notice here. So he's come in. And he started shooting systematically. And he does come and go back and forth. Comes over here, you notice some people are able to escape. So let's basically say it. Their situation is different than these guys. They had more time. They know, hear what's going on. This was the teacher went to the door because he cannot lock it. He cannot lock that door. And he, I believe he was a Holocaust survivor, they said. Uh, he survived the Holocaust and he put himself up against the door to buy time for his students to get out. And as you see, a number do. Here, they all survive. Again, it's unfortunate, but their situation becomes a little different than theirs. They're able, they have other options. And in their case, uh, they're able to barricade the door or find a way to block the door so he cannot get in. And so he goes back and attacks what he can. He shoots through the door, but they, uh, he, he can't get anybody. <clears throat> this is the guy that had studied mass shootings and realized, three minutes, I only have a few minutes. He chains up those doors that you saw so the police cannot get through. Police have to use a shotgun to blast through the chain to finally get in. When he hears the police coming, he knows they're here, he kills himself. So, 
he essentially was on campus for like two hours, wasn't he, after he killed the first victims? He That's was true. around. They don't know. Because they didn't re- yeah, where he was or when he was. They tried there. to determine what he had done. And um, they, they know he had a laptop. They were never able to find it because they wanted it um, to, to get a better motive. But he was he dressed all in black, and he was very quiet and uh, kind of a menacing type guy. And he was a loner. Uh, people didn't want him anything to do with him. So what his motive is was is never clearly known. But they know he studied clearly because he chained up those doors. He knows they're coming, and I'm going to try to get out as many people as I can. Here shows, you know, it's the rooms where he started, and as the situation uh, continues, these people have more options. Their situation changes a little bit because they have other options to do. All right. So the police arrive. They come in. And uh, as you see, the police finally come in, and everybody's told just to get down. Follow the commands of the police. Show your palms, you know, that you don't got anything. Do not move. If there is a weapon on the floor that the suspect used, let's say you took this weapon away from him, I strongly urge you get it away somewhere and don't have it just so there's no misunderstandings. And misunderstandings do happen. So, um, obviously you want to prevent that person, if he's still alive, from getting it, but disarm them, take it away, or put it somewhere where he can't get to it. All right. Understand what the police are supposed to do. And I say supposed to because we've had Parkland had Uvalde, where clearly the police did not do what they were supposed to do. But in general, if they're doing what they should, they're there to stop the killing. So if they come in and see a person who's wounded on the floor, they're going to move by them. They just move by them, and they're going to go find because they're trying to find the bad person to put a stop to it. That is what they're trying to do. Get to them first, and then afterwards, we will deal with the end. So just so you understand, this is the priority. And unfortunately, sometimes it can be a long time before somebody gets medical treatment. Here's a short video here. Are you ready? Hey, you're not cool. I'm not walking up there. Okay, so that's what you might expect to happen. Police officer may not know you. Obviously, if something like that happens here, uh, me, the chief, Chris Martin, obviously we all know you, you know us, but this place is huge. Battle Creek City, Calhoun County, it could be any number of police officers would be uh, called in to assist, and they don't know you, so you just got to do what they tell you to do. Just be aware of that. All right, medical. As I said... Police are there to try to stop what's going on. EMS people aren't going to come in here until they know that things are uh, secure. Or if they do, they will get a zone created, a safety zone, and they'll only go in so far. It could take hours for people to get medical treatment. Hopefully, that won't be the case. Hopefully, we'll be able to get in quickly. But because of that, seek additional training. College offers first aid courses. You can uh, get, uh, they put it on, I believe, active uh, during the uh, sessions, the uh, semester. Generally, there's first aid. There is Stop the Bleed. 
you can take these type of classes I mean it's unfortunate but it's not going to hurt you to have this knowledge because in the event that one of your uh, co-workers or even a stranger that you don't know, a student, gets hurt, you may have to offer them medical treatment. I urge you to get this type of training so you can at least try to help them out until uh, they can get full treatment later. <clears throat> Personal issues, you can expect mental trauma. Understand that you may need support. If you go through this, something like this, um, just don't think it's just gonna bounce off you and not have any effect on you. Most likely it will. I mean, it just depends on the person. Some people are more resilient than others. They just are. But if you need help, understand you should Seek it. Don't think that um, I should be stronger or something like that. If you really want help and need help, you can get it. And the college has HelpNet through um, you know, human resources. And that type of uh, help, which I'm sure if something like that happened, the college would be embracing some type of counseling to be coming in here. But obviously, just be aware that this is going to be very traumatic. Things are going to go on. Um, I mean, uh, I, I think about things that I've gone through in my career where I get things replaying in my mind a lot of times. It's the same thing. You go through uh, trauma, you should expect that, and it's okay to seek help. Be aware of it. All right. <clears throat> you notice I have not said once one of the names of these guys that have done any of these shootings. We don't name them because that's what they wanted. They wanted their notoriety. Said, I'm going to go down and infamy as the guy that did this. Don't name them. Heck with that. These are the people that you should be thinking about. She was in Sandy Hook, Victoria Soto. <clears throat> she uh, stood and tried to stop uh, the shooter to try to protect her children. She died doing so. This is a uh, Angela McQueen. She's a phys ed teacher. She tackled a uh, active shooter to disarm him and hold him until a police could have get there. Active shooter events. We talked about them. Or active attacker events. You have someone or a group of individuals coming in trying to commit mass murder. Doesn't have to have, do anything else with uh, revenge or a bank robbery or, or, or anything like that. That's what we're talking about, active attacker events. We talked about disaster response, how your body will react under stress. We talked about denial, deliberation, and actually getting to the decisive moment where you're going to do something. But you need to know that because of your body, you're going to be in denial. You know, you're going to look to others for uh, help. You need to get out of those as quick as possible. Get out of denial as quick as possible and do something. And what the three things I want you to do, one of them, focus on that. That's what we're talking about. All right, so let's talk about how things are supposed to go here. We're going to talk about KCC and lockdown procedures. So before I start this, I, I, I need to put a base here because uh, the base really isn't in here, is that we have a system in place to notify staff and students of problems and it's our emergency alert system, which we encourage everybody to sign up for. But it's obviously it isn't mandatory, but we tell you to please sign up for it because we have this system in place where we put out, and it doesn't necessarily have to be emergency, but even if for the college is closing because of a snow day, or please stay away from over here because there's no power or, or something or another. <coughs> and so, 
um, it's very important that you guys get the emergency alert system and basically you can sign up for it on your smartphones, get it through your email, text, but also be aware that the emergency alert system is hooked into every computer in the college. So if someone right now was putting out an emergency alert, it would show up right now. We would see it on our computers and in the marquees that are out here. So that is the system we kind of use. However, we also have wardens, and those are individuals that have been chosen to, uh, we, to help us convey information. And we convey that through walkie-talkies like this that we ask the wardens to carry. And it's a two-way street. The wardens can give us information as well, stuff going on. So that is another way, another person in the cog, so to speak, that can get out information to staff and students about something that's going on. And obviously, uh, you yourself, your, your own senses will tell you. But uh, the reason I bring it up because I, I talk about lockdowns and getting out information, uh, and uh, it doesn't really talk about the importance of the emergency alert system. So, okay. Finally, there we go. Okay, basically, what is the purpose of a lockdown? School lockdown. Basically, what we're talking about is we want to remove students and staff from a threat. We want to isolate a dangerous situation for much of the school, allowing a, an accurate account of students within rooms. And not, it says students, but it can be any number of people. And depending on the situation, it actually facilitates a evacuation from a dangerous area. It really does. If you put everybody in a lockdown situation, you have a building and you know everybody basically is locked in these rooms, it makes it easy for law enforcement to come in and just systematically evacuate these rooms. And that also helps the reason why schools are put in the lockdown. But it's more importantly is we want to uh, get people away from the threat. All right. There are two primary types of lockdown. We have an outside threat and we have an inside threat. Okay. If um, we have an outside threat, you have like Battle Creek City Police or Calhoun County or something bad is going on immediately around the college or even uh, one of the satellites. And we are going to put the whole place in the lockdown to prevent that bad thing from coming inside. You would get an alert, hopefully. Again, if everything is going correctly, telling you we're going into lockdown because of this, whatever it is. The other reason is an inside threat. We'll now try to get information to people as soon as possible, advising them that the threat is here, inside, in Severn. Go into lockdown, uh, be aware, get out if you can. And um, it's important. It's basically incumbent upon us as law enforcement, as the administration, is to try to get that information to you guys as quickly and accurately as possible. Okay. Basically, KCC administration or designee will make an announcement that there's a lockdown warning. Okay. We put it in the lockdown. We will then, with security help and the help of our wardens, we would uh, try to clear the halls and get people to where they uh, should be uh, so that we don't have a lot of people milling about. If you're in a room, basically keep people away from windows. If you happen to have windows, uh, depending on the threat, obviously, if you've got a guy with a long gun or any type of gun, maybe you don't want to be looking out the window, that would probably be a bad idea. You keep an accurate I, I, uh, account of who's in the classroom with you. And if you think someone is missing, you should note that and uh, have that information with you when you are instructed to leave. Now, 
We will continue. Control all movement, but continue your classes or continue what you're doing. Only move when notified by uh, Warden's Public Safety or the alert system. And if there's an all clear, it will be given by the same system. <clears throat> now, if someone wants to leave, I mean, you, you guys not aren't so much in a teaching setting, but um, we'll use Michelle. You're in there, and we get this information that Battle Creek City is chasing a bad guy over here, and one of your dental students want to leave. <clears throat> you're not going to tackle them and hold them down. I don't expect that. If they leave, you say, you're gone, that's up to you, but you're not getting back in. And that even goes on in, in an inside threat. So, as much as possible control, tell people, you know, let's just stay put until this is over with, all right? Okay, if you're doing something outside and this goes down, hopefully you could get back in before the place goes into lockdown, but if not, then maybe you need to, if your vehicle's here, if you can get to your vehicle, do so. If you're with a group of individuals, maybe you need to uh, move as a group to uh, another area that you think, depending on the circumstances, would be all right. If we go into a true lockdown, these will not work, okay? You would need a hard key to get through doors, and most of you do not have hard keys. So, get away. If you can take a group with you, great. Um, the alternate location be identified, uh, okay, if the threat's over here, at, uh, we're being told the threat's over by Davidson, hey, let's go over here to Burger King and we'll all have a walk. Okay, something like that. Let's get away. All right. Okay, inside threat. Administration, KCC, public safety, put on alert. The threat is inside. All right. Get everybody into the nearest classroom. And um, if you're outside, do not come here. You would not believe that active shooter situations across the country, people actually have come to the location um, when they were alerted for it. Well, but anyway, do not come in. If the threat is inside, uh, you're going to go into lockdown. If you're a warden, we want you to help clear the, the, the hallways. But if you're facing imminent threat, I wouldn't expect you to do that. I expect you to save yourself and protect yourself. I'm not asking you to face a threat. But if you're told, we're all going to go in lockdown because the threat's over here in a roll building, um, before you all go into uh, to your... Uh, offices or wherever you're at, hey, let's clear this place uh, uh, real quick and let's get inside. And then we can start locking and doing barricading and all that other thing that you need to do. But <clears throat> when we say lock classroom doors, we're pulling the magnet. Okay, move away from windows, shut off lights. Again, who's in here with us? Let's make a list. And if somebody's missing, you should note that as well and take the list with you when you finally get to leave out of here. All right. <clears throat> if you lock that door, you're over here hiding, you barricaded the door, whatever you did, and someone comes to the door, um, I don't want you to let them in, okay? I'm, I understand human nature, but uh, I'm telling you in general, if you in a lockdown situation, you've got someone pounding on the door telling me, let me in, let me in, let me in, don't open that door. You've got other people to think about. I also know if you hear your best friend out there, you're probably going to open the door, but I'm telling you not to open the door. I get it, okay? I understand that. Um, there could be a person there being held under duress. That's why we're saying that, okay? Fire alarms. Have bad guys use fire alarms to try to get to victims? Yes, they have. There have been 
staff in other places that used fire alarms, but in their mind it was, I want to let people know what's going on, and they pulled the fire alarm. Probably not a good idea. I caveat ignoring the fire alarm to down here. Please note that such threats, such as a confirmed fire or your uh, intruder in the classroom, may override your lockdown procedure. Okay? You know for a fact you got a fire. Don't ignore the fire alarm. Get the hell out of here. You got to. You just. It, you're weighing options here. Okay, you're going to stay put until uh, the threat's been neutralized and you get an all clear by mass alert system or warden. But in actuality, if you have an actual active uh, attacker or active uh, shooter, you're probably going to be notified to just stay put because the police are going to clear the place. Because as we're taught, you see one shooter, you're looking for a second. You're looking for another attacker. You know, we get the individual. Are, who else are you with? Who are you with? We're going to try to look for that. All right. We have to have a, an effective plan or strategy to include for failure. All right. Recognize that implementing a lockdown is meant to prevent the intruder from having access to classrooms, students, and staff. We've discussed threat recognition, you know, as opposed to gunfire that you might hear. Or you hear screaming, you recognize the threat, you then move to control access by locking doors. Lockdown implementation, uh, implementation occurs and law enforcement are coming. We've talked about that. What we haven't talked about is what you do if the intruder makes it into the classroom. Hiding under the desk has not been, uh, really been proven to be successful. Take out. If the shooter is in your area and you cannot run, fight. Simply taking a position under the desk in a fetal position will not do anything to prevent you from being a victim. Basically, you're at the whim of this person. Again, getting back to realistically understanding what's happening. It is a last resort. It's unrealistic to assume that people will not be seriously hurt or killed as a result. But at the same time, it's far more unrealistic to think that hiding under a desk is going to save you. Fighting is an option. It should be your last option. So you need to think about it. Be prepared again for this option and to uh, obtain training for all of you, not just teachers. And that's what we're doing. Okay, do good guys finish last? No, it's unprepared. It's survival versus prevailing. If you're going to get beat, you might as well get beat doing something, not nothing. All right? You can hide under the desk, and maybe the shooter won't shoot you. Is Yes, you survived, but did you really prevail? All right? More likely... We've seen it time and time again where they systematically shoot people uh, that basically have given up, not doing anything. I'm telling you, if you're going to get shot, might as well get shot doing something. Fight. What you do might buy time for somebody else. Lieutenant Murphy, though, he got shot mul multiple times. He took the attention away from um, the suspects looking at other victims and he took the brunt of that attack. There are other people that have, have chosen to attack and do something and their <coughs> attack gave others a chance to get away. So I'm strongly suggesting you think about that. Okay. Ultimate lesson for you today. Think about a plan. Script what you will do you are faced with one of these situations. Your strategy is not just to be used at KCC. Think about what you will do if you're outside shopping, dining, anywhere. Develop a strategy. Okay? Each of you, you're going to go to your areas where you work and start thinking about it. If I hear this, 
this is going on, what am I going to do? And start practicing thinking about what you're going to do. Maybe you and a co-worker get together and say, okay, if this happens, we're all going to go over here to this room over here, and we're going to barricade that room. And then get up and do it. Do it repeatedly. That's me. That's why most of you know how to get a hold of me. Uh, here's, a little, here's a little light blue book. <laughs>